Can you hear me okay? Sounds good? Yeah, all right. It is uh, it's really great to be here. This wonderfully organized conference, what a team of people we have looking after us. I'm especially grateful for the invitation because I'm a bit of an outsider to the world of uh, Poisson geometry, so uh, it's really great to be able to come here and, and, and learn something. That may be the best part. I will learn something. Whether I teach you something is another matter. I want to talk about uh, something that uh, that must be very close to, to many of your hearts, which is this quantization commutes with reduction problem. But I want to look at it from a point of view which is close to my heart which is uh, this business of K-homology. Uh, so the history of this problem is, uh, I'm sure, well known to nearly all of you. But we'll come back to it uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, this was uh, more or less formulated, this problem was more or less formulated by Gilman Sternberg and then was proved it's become a bit of a sport to prove this theorem. There are now multitudes of uh, proofs, but uh, two stand out. As far as this lecture is concerned, uh, it's proved uh, in a very nice degree of uh, generality. This problem was solved, by, first of all, by Mein Rankin, uh, in, in ways which are uh, familiar to the world of geometry. There are manifolds and the manifolds are cut into pieces and bordisms are constructed and so on. And then there's another proof which is what I really want to discuss uh, which is quite alien to the world of geometry. I was uh, A friend of mine emailed me uh, yesterday. He said, oh you're at this Poisson geometry conference. If you're going to talk about this they're just not going to like it. They, you know, you shouldn't even do it. But uh, what I want to do is uh, describe this very analytic argument which proves this theorem which is uh, either very analytic or very geometric depending on, depending on how you look at it. I want to try and make uh, a certain proof uh, of this theorem which is very analytic. I want to make it as geometric as possible using uh, this uh, business of k-homology. As for k-homology, it's the brainchild of our uh, friend and leader, Michael Atiyah. And uh, I'll start off by trying to describe uh, some of what we need to know about k-homology in order to uh, proceed. So, by the end of the talk, I hope to uh, convince you that uh, this problem, which you probably are somewhat familiar with, and this uh, theory, which you may or may not be familiar with, do have something interesting to uh, tell one another. That's the purpose uh, of the talk. And uh, let me begin with uh, the basics. I mean, how would you recognize k-homology if you saw it? What is it? It's by now quite a large and elaborate uh, subject. You could, in fact, write a book on this subject. Uh, so I will just uh, scrape the, the surface. I'll show you as little as, uh, analysis as I can, only the, the basic uh, details. Anyway, what you need uh, to start with is uh, to understand a little bit about uh, not k-homology, but k-theory. which the K-theory I'm speaking of here is, is the, the topological K-theory of Atir and Hesselbrock, to, to mention another great mathematician who uh, passed away very recently. So this, uh, if X is a reasonable space, a compact space, this uh, consists of equivalence classes, or is a, an, an abelian group generated by equivalence classes of vector bundles on X. Uh, the wonderful Bart periodicity theorem allows us to elevate K-homology from being just a group to being uh, the zeroth group in some cohomology, sorry, K theory, from being just a group to being the zeroth group in some uh, cohomology theory. That's why there's a little uh, zero there. And so it's a little bit more than just a group, it's a cohomology theory.
And if you're a homotopy theorist, whenever you have a cohomology theory, even if it's some fancy uh, generalized cohomology theory, bam, there's also a homology theory to go along with it. And so this is the associated zeroth group of the associated uh, homology theory. And if you're a homotopy theorist, that's all you have to say, because there it is. But uh, this isn't a homotopy theory conference, so let's try and make this a, a little more uh, precise, a little more informative. And one of the ways that homology theories work with cohomology theories is that they uh, tend to, to multiply together in interesting ways. So there are what you might call products, what you do call products. And the one which is the most uh, relevant to k-homology goes like this. If you have a k-homology class, some sort of cycle for k-homology theory, whatever it is, and if you have a k-theory class, maybe not just on x, but uh, on x uh, times y. So a k-theory class is basically a vector bundle. I'm speaking of a vector bundle on uh, x times y. Uh, you, sh you ought to think of that as a family of vector bundles on x parameterized by y. Anyway, this uh, group here contains classes which manufacture from such a family a single vector bundle just on y. If you're a homotopy theorist, the right generation, you'd call this the slant product. And one of the things you can do with k-homology classes, should you uh, find them, is you can uh, build maps on k-theory just like this. So the up the stairs zeros means k-theory, which is vector bundles, a tier in Husserbrook. The downstairs zero means uh, k-homology like this. And of course this should be some appropriately functorial uh, pairing. It also has some additional property. K-theory is a, is a ring, isn't it? It's not just a, an abelian group. And uh, so both sides of this equation here are modules over the k-theory of y. This is actually a module map over the k-theory of y. And um, so k-homology classes give us these, these transformations, continuous transformations of some sort. They continuously take vector bundles on x to vector bundles on a point, continuously in the sense that if you have a continuous family of vector bundles on x parameterized by y, what you get out of that is a vector bundle on the parameter space y. Okay? In fact, if you have such a mechanism of going from this k-theory group to this one, which is functorial and multiplicative and so on, that's it. It has to be a k-homology class, at least for the sort of reasonable spaces that we're talking about here. So k-homology is all about building k-homology classes. is all about building ways of transforming one k-theory group into another. Excuse me. Okay. So K-theory, sorry, K-homology is guaranteed to exist by the homotopy theorists. Thank you, homotopy theorists. And uh, they also tell you how to recognize uh, a K-homology class. As long as you have a class in uh, some way of going, transforming vector bundles on X times Y to Y, which has the appropriate properties, it must be a K-homology class. That's what K-homology is. That's how you recognize a K-homology class should you pick one up somewhere on the beach. Okay. And... Uh, it's easy to pick these things up. They're all over the place in geometries. So these things have come to be called geometric cycles for k-homology. Uh, suppose you have the following uh, information. So I want to manufacture some way of taking k-theory classes, vector bundles on x times y to vector bundles on y. It's not so hard. Suppose I have a triple like this. So M is, uh, I want M to be some sort of decent uh, manifold, some suitably oriented manifold, a spin C manifold. I want E just to be a complex vector bundle on, X, on M. And as for F, it's just a map from M into X. And if you have such uh, data, then you can do the following thing. We want to go from the K-theory of x times y, and we want to end up in the k-theory of y uh, via some procedure which is going to be determined by this uh, cycle here. So what can you do? Well, the first thing you can do is you can get rid of x and make it into an m. This one here up, I'm sorry. So, got it. You're not still reading this. Fast reader, that's very good. 
Can everyone read what they want to read now? Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, yeah, so we could pull back. So to speak, a long F. <coughs> because F maps from M to X, you can pull back a vector model from X to M, or you can indeed pull back a whole family uh, like this. And then K theory is uh, a ring, like I just said. So you could multiply by the vector bundle E, or the class of the vector bundle E. It's a vector bundle on uh, M, but you could think of it as a constant family of vector bundles on M times uh, parameterized by Y. In other words, a vector bundle on M times Y. And you can multiply by it. Okay, now you'll end up here, which is not exactly where you want to be. Uh, but you can do the following thing. One of the things that Atir and Herzebrook did, in fact, it was the reason they invented uh, K-theory in the first place, was that they constructed wrong-way maps uh, associated to maps between these oriented manifolds, spin-C manifolds. So you could do the following thing. You can look at the wrong-way map, the Gizen homomorphism, associated to the map which just collapses M down to a point. Like that. What is this map? Well, it's, uh, it involves uh, bot periodicity. As I say, this is right at the foundation of what uh, k-homology is, but uh, what k-theory is for that matter, but I won't go into it. Another thing you could do is this. You could do some index of families construction. Because the sorts of manifolds that we're talking about here, these spin C manifolds, whatever they are, are manifolds which have Dirac operators. <coughs> and if I have a Dirac operator on M, and if I have a vector bundle on M, I can couple the Dirac operator to the vector bundle, that's a standard construction, and then I can take the index, which is a difference of two vector spaces. And if I have not one vector bundle on M, but a family of vector bundles parameterized by Y, then I'll get a family of index problems, and the uh, index of a family of index problems is, is another vector bundle, or a difference of vector bundles on Y. So there are two ways of, of doing this, and of course, there's an index theorem which says that they're one and the same thing. So that's uh, what k-homology looks like. It cycles, uh, in fact, it's not hard to show that these are the only cycles. Every cycle, every element of k-homology is represented, is represented by one of these things. Oops. And, uh, okay. Clear so far? The questions from students? No. Nope. So these are cycles, and uh, we can go a little bit uh, further to uh, uh, explain, uh, at least uh, in outline, what this group is, how you actually obtain it from the uh, cycles. So this is how to recognize it, how about how to construct it. And there are two alternatives, as you might expect, uh, coming from these two ways of doing the final stage of this construction, something using analysis and fret home operators down here, something just using the machinery of topology uh, up here. So there's a geometric way of, of looking at k-homology, a completely geometric way. Uh, it doesn't involve uh, anything unfamiliar. It involves construction of certain fiber bundles. It involves uh, Buddhism. Of course, you have to work out what exactly is going on, but you can put an equivalence relation uh, on these uh, cycles. And the most natural thing to uh, include in the equivalence relation is the appropriate notion of Buddhism. But you have to do something a little bit more, thanks to the Bob periodicity theorem. There are only two K homology groups, just like there are two K theory groups. There's an even one and an odd one. It doesn't make sense to talk about a K homology cycle of, uh, of uh, dimension six, because six is the same as four as far as K homology is concerned. So you have to have some way of moving cycles among the even dimensions. And that's... Uh, that you can work out. For example, uh, if you have uh, a, one of these geometric cycles up here, and if you happen to have a, a CP1 bundle over M, you, then you could pull back the vector bundle E to that CP1 bundle, and you could pull back F to a map from the total space of the bundle, and you get a new cycle, and part of this uh, bundle modification part of the equivalence relation is that the new cycle coming from the CP1 bundle is the same as the old one. And uh, 
that and, and a few more uh, related constructions give you the equivalence relation. It's very easy and it's very uh, limited. It's not uh, difficult, therefore. I, I mean, there aren't many ways of, uh, in which we deem cycles to be equivalent. And the good thing about that is it's quite easy to build maps out of k-homology and show that they are well, well defined. You have a cycle uh, and you want to show that some construction of the cycle, some number, let's say you attach to the cycle, is, uh, is well defined. It only depends on the equivalence class of the cycle. No problem, because the only things you have to check is the, that the number is bordism invariant and has some uh, property with respect to passing to bundles, like the CP1 bundle that I just mentioned. So there, although I said earlier on there are uh, lots of uh, cycles of this geometric type out there, actually that's a bit of a lie. Compared to what I'm going to show you, show you there are relatively few cycles and relatively few equivalences. All, they all come from one source, which is just uh, geometry. And as a result of that, as I just said, it's easy to build maps uh, out of uh, k-homology. For, uh, for example, you could do the following thing. Suppose you have one of these geometric cycles, and you want to get something back in the traditional world of algebraic topology f uh, from the cycle. You could write down some crazy formula. It's not so hard. Take M, and uh, what could we do? We could cap it with churn character V. It's not really important what this formula uh, represents. It's just some recipe familiar to algebraic topologists, and where it ends up is in the homology of the manifold. Um, because there are so few cycles, it's not difficult to build maps out of k-homology because you only have to define it on a few representative objects. And because there are so few equivalence relations, it's quite easy to show that various things are well-defined. For example, this thing is a well-defined map from k-homology to, k uh, to ordinary homology. On the other hand, there's a completely uh, different side uh, to the story here, an analytic side. Uh, do, this really is due to a tier. This was a tier's focus. This whole perspective is due to a tier. Many people uh, contributed. And the cycles are a little bit uh, more complicated. And, and because I was warned by my friend to limit the amount of analysis, I'm, I'm not going to say too much. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. It is because I pushed forward by M. Thank you. Yeah, the K homology of X should clearly map to the uh, ordinary homology of X. So what Atiyah suggested, and then several uh, people, individuals, groups of individuals later on figured out, is that uh, an alternative, uh, completely different perspective on k-homology can be uh, put together using Fredholm operators on uh, Hilbert spaces. So you have some Fredholm operator F mapping some Hilbert space to itself. Fredholm operator is almost invertible. Modular finite rank operators, it is invertible. Oh, they could be different Hilbert spaces. It's no big deal. And uh, what about the space X? We shouldn't forget about the space X. We're trying to define the k-homology of X. And that's... Uh, The way X is remembered is that you look at the algebra of continuous functions on X. It's a, it's a ring, it's a C-star algebra, and you make these Hilbert spaces. You assume as part of the data of the cycles that uh, these Hilbert spaces are C of X modules. You might call these analytic cycles. And then there are some axioms, which uh, we'll, I won't uh, get to uh, right now. Okay. Well, what I do want to say, in contrast to, to what's up there, It's a relatively speaking, there are many cycles, there are many, many different ways of building k-homology classes using analysis. Uh, uh, this turns out to be a much uh, bigger, in some sense, flabbier uh, world that is both good and bad. And the way that these uh, are made into a group is that a certain equivalence relation is, is defined, which is basically some notion of a homotopy, but it's an extremely general notion of homotopy. For example, in this uh, notion of uh, 
homotopy for a very, very trivial, trivial reason. All of the index uh, zero operators are, are contractible. They're all the space of all index uh, zero operators. Disregarding for a moment the C of X module structure, that space is, is, is a contractible space. Okay. That's actually true uh, uh, in, in almost any notion of homotopy, but it's a difficult theorem in general. Here it's just a piece of cake. Okay. So this theory has a different uh, character. Lots and lots of cycles, uh, lots and lots of coolness relations. You have to make an investment in understanding you know, what a Hilbert space is in order to make sense of it, uh, but, but there you go. And they're, re they're related in a fairly obvious way. There is only one analog. Th these are all models for k-homology, but just to distinguish them t for one moment, let me call one of them geometric. And the other one, analytic. Uh, there's a natural transformation between these two realizations of k-homology, as there should be, in fact, a natural isomorphism if they are both k-homology. And it does uh, uh, the obvious thing. Uh, maybe the obvious thing. Let's build the Dirac operator, which acts on L2 of M. Some spinners and then E like that. The same. So there's a Fretum operator for you. And uh, what about this Hilbert space L2 of M? Well, it's a C of X module, isn't it? Because M maps to X, so we can use the, the natural M C of M module structure on this space, pull it back to a C of X module structure. So this is a cycle. And if you're of a sort of growth and uh, turn of mind, You might make the following observation, favorite observation of Paul Baum and Alain Kahn, which is that the fact that this is well defined, which is not that terrible, terribly difficult to check, because after all, there are very few things you have to check. That's the point I was making before. This is uh, really just another way of saying uh, the T Singer index theorem. This funny recipe, which was here which I didn't want to spend too much time on. So little time did I spend that I didn't even get it right. Uh, but this uh, now correct recipe uh, is, is what you see on the left-hand side of the index formula, on the topological side of the index formula. On the other hand, uh, analysis is what the other side of the index formula is about. And getting the details right, showing that this map is well-defined, is the same thing as proving the Tiersinger index theorem. Okay. So there's some interesting uh, theory uh, going on here. By the way, this, as I say, this whole thing is uh, due to a tear, and as uh, Sergei Gukov pointed out, we're in a situation here where we're mixing some, some rather different areas of mathematics, right? And according to uh, tear, this is what fun is all about. So, are you, are you, are you having fun? Okay. So Sergei Gukov says that Akira says that this is fun. Okay. Now, let me uh, turn before my time runs out here. Okay, we're doing fine. Let me turn uh, a little more towards this uh, problem, the, the business of uh, making contact with an actual, uh, an actual mathematical. Uh, formally a mathematical conjecture, a mathematical theorem. I guess we certainly have a mathematical theorem up here, but it's a different mathematical theorem uh, that I want to talk about. And for that purpose, I need to just jazz up everything that I've just told you, but only in a modest way. Uh, the, this entire subject was revolutionized back in the 1980s by Kasparov, who took a close look at equivariant k-homology for non-compact groups, but here I'm just interested in a very simple case where G is a compact Lie group. And it's all the same. Nothing uh, new uh, happens here. It's possible to define equivariant geometric uh, k-homology using equivariant cycles. So the situation here trying to define something like this. Now x uh, should be a G space, of course, compact G space. Geometric cycles are exactly what you'd expect them to be. They're equivariant, G equivariant, spin C manifolds, G equivariant vector bundles, G equivariant maps. Same thing for the fret operators, this analytic story. 
We just look at equivariant operators acting on Hilbert spaces with a G unitary structure, blah, blah, blah. So that's uh, rather easy. And uh, here's a, a little calculation, which is the beginning of a lot of trouble. But this itself is very easy. You don't need any of these models to, to check this lemma. This lemma follows from the fact that K-theory is the homology theory that goes with... Excuse me, K-homology is the homology theory which goes with K-theory. Suppose you have a space, uh, I'll call it Z, and suppose G acts on Z in a trivial way. No point gets moved at all. Which could happen. Uh, the, the two interesting cases, uh, I guess there's really only one, but the two cases I have in mind is where X is a point. That's, uh, that would work, right? Or if X is something more complicated, you can just divide out by the action of G. X mod G is a space on which G acts uh, uh, with, without moving any point. And what I want to look at is the equivariant k-homology of this trivial g-space. I mean, why not? It's easy to see that there's some uh, simple comparison map which goes like this. If you had an ordinary cycle for k-homology, or indeed an abstract element in this k-homology group, which was not equivariant at all, you could think of it as being equivariant for the trivial action. So every one of these gives one of these. And the same is true if you multiply such a cycle by a representation of G, everything is a module over the K-theory of a point, and the equivariant K-theory of a point is R of G. And so there's always such a map as this. It's a very concrete map, and it's an isomorphism. That's the little lemma. So you can do the following thing. which is what we want to study and what these characters here were in effect studying. Suppose I have a class C and it lies in the k-homology, the equivariant k-homology of some space. X like this, and it's, just, it's a space X, and G may be moving around the point. It's not X, uh, it's not a trivial G space. I have some class. Maybe it's one of these guys, one of these geometric guys, or maybe it's one of these uh, analytic guys here. Where did the analytic guys go? Move it down here. Yeah. And if I have such a class, I can, I can uh, so to speak, Fourier analyze it uh, in the following way. I can break it up into its uh, Fourier modes. I'll get class, maybe I'll call them C sub pi and sub pi. So the pi here is just some class of very useful representations of G. And this identity, of course, is taking place now in the uh, G equivariant K homology. of X modulo G. My class in X, I can just push down to a class on X mod G, and uh, now I break it up into modes like this, and each of these pieces, oh, the zero is doing that, each of these pieces is just a regular k-homology class like this. And you could ask the following uh, general problem, question, I guess, Set yourself the following general task, which is to determine what these things are. Question? Yeah. Is already not trivial. The excuse me. No, you do not assume x to be trivial. That's correct. On this board over here, x is some random g space. So That's the reason I cunningly called the other guy z. Which belong to different things, to different groups. Right. So if you want to make this into a, a true formula, you'd have to give a name to this map. Maybe pi. Uh, pi would be a terrible choice. P. And then you could push forward P. And you'd get something in the k homology of this, the g equivariant k homology of this quotient space. Uh, but that breaks up, uh, as I've indicated here. Okay, and the general problem has been waiting so long 
sort of obvious now is just to determine somehow these uh, coefficients. So I suppose you have some interesting cycle. I'm going to to decompose it into these pieces. Maybe it's an interesting problem. Maybe it isn't an interesting problem. But uh, anyway, it's a problem. And uh, let me say two things about this problem. I need to ask the organizers, in, in the world of Poisson geometry, one hour is 50 minutes or one hour is one hour? One hour is one hour, okay. It's like fishing, I guess. You just relax all the time in the world. There's no hurry. Okay. I'm I'm rather certain that this uh, general problem doesn't have a, a good, interesting solution in general. For example, you might ask this for any cycle C any geometric cycle, let's make it a little more concrete. And you might ask, what are these pieces? Well, forget it, except in uh, some very simple situations. uh, uh, I don't think there's a good answer to this problem. Unless the group is really easy. If the group is really easy, then then, then matters are different. If the group is, say, a circle, then things are different. But in general, this looks like a, a hopeless problem. But it does have some interesting aspects. Here's a little remark. Analytically speaking, I mean, if you're, if you're studying uh, cycles of this analytic type, which, uh, of which this is an example here, there's a sort of trivial solution, which um, therefore an interesting solution, but it's, it's a solution, and this is uh, not a completely trivial uh, remark. There's a trivial solution. So, for example... Let me um, just consider the trivial representation, speaking of trivial, but the same remark applies to any representation. So if I have a cycle coming from an, a, a fret home operator, this is an analytic cycle. It's a fret home operator on some Hilbert space, and the group has to be acting on the Hilbert space, and the Hilbert space has to be a module over the ring of functions on X. I'm stuff a word here. And the operator should be equivariant, G equivariant. You could do the following thing. You could just restrict F to the fixed set inside the Hilbert space. I guess I do want to write down what the Hilbert space is. And it, since it's equivariant, it maps the fixed set uh, to itself, uh, like that. And H, H started out life as a module over the ring of functions on X, but the fixed set is no longer a module over the ring of functions on X, but it's certainly a module over those functions on X which are left fixed by the action of G, which is the same thing as the functions on X mod G. So there's a cycle. It's a fret home operator between Hilbert spaces, and the Hilbert space carries a, an action of uh, this ring of functions. And, and there are some other axioms which I didn't tell you about, but they're satisfied too. And you could do this not just for the trivial representation, but with uh, almost no imagination. You could do it for any representation. So you can carry out this decomposition. Okay? It's kind of trivial. It's not a, in itself an answer to anything, but it, it, uh, at least you can do it. Uh, and that's not a, a completely vacuous remark because in, on the geometric side, there's no way of even getting started and understanding how to decompose such a cycle anyhow into its, uh, so to speak, isotypical pieces, its Fourier components. Where are we here? It's not this obvious that for a trivial representation in a very general case, you should just uh, get the, the image in the, in the map from equivalent to uh, capable uh, are, you, are you asking whether there's an obvious uh, formula for this guy, for example, for the trivial representation under all circumstances? If you have such an obvious formula, let us uh, discuss. Uh, no, it's not obvious that there's uh, such a formula. 
Take an operator, I mean, let's just let's think about this analytically for a moment. You take an operator, uh, and it's g-equivariant, but let's forget about the g-equivariance, okay? Uh, let's, uh, and we do a calculation, thanks to the wonderful theorem of Atiyah and Singer, and we find out that the index is 7, okay? Just as a number, 7 is, it, it's, but it's also a sum of representations, so that 7 may be 1 plus 3 plus 3, where the two 3s represent non-trivial representations, okay? When you perform the reduction, you change the index. The reduced cycle, this thing I'm calling C pi 0, would have index 1, not 7, okay? So you have to do something geometrically which changes the index, and just forgetting the G structure would not change the index. Okay. All right. The other remark is that the famous uh, quantization commutes with reduction problem fits into this framework uh, very nicely. That doesn't necessarily help you, but uh, you, know, you can do it if you wanted to. The F isn't so important here, but uh, suppose here we have some symplectic manifold. And suppose uh, E is something which probably doesn't have to be explained here. Suppose he is a, a line bundle whose curvature is a symplectic form up to some multiple of 2 and pi and uh, i. And uh, suppose the action is Hamiltonian of the group G, which certainly doesn't need to be explained. And suppose finally that 0 is a regular value of the moment map It's a special sort of cycle. It's a very special sort of cycle. When you build k-homology, you need uh, lots and lots of uh, spin-c cycles. Uh, uh, among the spin-c cycles uh, are the symplectic cycles, but they're very few and far between. It's very hard to make the jump from something like a symplectic manifold, uh, which carries some sort of integrable structure, to just an arbitrary spin-c manifold, which is basically nothing. Anyway, if you have such a thing, let's call it C. Then the conjecture of Gilliman and Sternberg, eventually proved by uh, Eckhart, Meinrinken, and also by Tern and Zhang, is that when you look at its C0 part, I've elevated it very slightly to k-homology, but it's, that's no big deal whatsoever. If you look at its zeroth uh, Fourier coefficient, so then what you're supposed to do is form the reduced space associated to all of this data, and the reduced, what am I calling it, line bundle E, and what I might as well call the reduced map F, so F reduced Fred is just the map, the obvious map here into X much. <clears throat> right, the reduced uh, manifold is, is among other things a subset of uh, X mod G, uh, M mod G, so it maps to X mod G. Okay. So that's a very beautiful and uh, interesting and uh, compelling uh, example of this uh, general phenomenon here. And that's what we want to try and understand. Okay, we spent some time, I spent, I spent uh, too much time gassing on about k-homology and slow motion and so on. Uh, but uh, I want to try and say something intelligent about this uh, using all of the apparatus that I've been talking about. I should say that uh, the uh, extent to which uh, anything I say will be intelligent uh, will be due to uh, Tian and Zhang. What I want to do is uh, take this argument of Tian and Zhang, which if you've seen it is kind of terrifying, and put it in a context where it looks a little, a little less uh, frightening using k-homology, some techniques from non-commutative uh, geometry. Uh, I was at, in China last week and uh, listening to Zhang, Weiping Zhang give uh, talks on this theorem, but on another theorem, in which he's traveling in exa exactly the opposite uh, direction. Let me squander a couple of minutes on a beautiful uh, theorem of Alain Kahn. Just to make a point about diversity, about the very d various different ways in which you can do mathematics. Here's a beautiful theorem of Kahn, which maybe you know. Here's a manifold M, and it's foliated. <coughs> and suppose the leaves uh, are spin manifolds. So it, and suppose there's a metric, at least a metric defined along the leaves, and suppose the leaves uh, are spin manifolds.
and uh, in this matrix both the scalar curvature is positive so on each leaf the scalar curvature is uh, positive it's on the leaves then uh, Alain Cohn proved he proved this using stuff you, you guys like he proved this using uh, groupoids and uh, so on groupoid algebras under this uh, hypo uh, set of hypotheses, he proved that the, what am I calling it, M, the A-roof uh, genus of M, this class evaluated on M, is zero. If the manifold consists of one leaf, if it's just not a foliation at all, then this is the famous theorem of Lishnerovitz, isn't it, to mention another relevant name here. So this is a Lishnerovitz type theorem. Narrow. Oops, now I'm getting into trouble here. Sorry? What is A hat? Oh, A hat is some, some object from algebraic topology. It's the object which appears in the index theorem in the case of uh, the Dirac operator on a spin manifold. If you don't know what A hat is, A roof, uh, it doesn't matter. The foliation doesn't matter in that formula. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's deliberate that there is no mention of the foliation uh, in the theorem, except in the hypotheses. Yeah, that's what makes it. Uh, <laughs> that's what makes it a beautiful and interesting. The manifold need not be a spin manifold. So you, the way you're supposed to prove this is you're supposed to imagine that the, the foliation is a vibration, and then you sort of carry out this integration by parts. When you integrate by parts along the way, you're calculating the uh, A roof class of the leaves, and that's zero by the ordinary Lishnerovitz theorem. And the reason this doesn't work in general is that not every foliation is a vibration, and the space of leaves is usually crap, as we say in America, which means you have to do some, uh, sub make some substitute for that space of leaves, and that's where Alan Cohn's uh, groupoid sister algebra comes in. This is an anecdote, and the reason I'm telling you this, first of all, is it's a, uh, just a beautiful theorem. Uh, second of all, uh, 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 Wei-Ping Zhang has spent the last uh, five years now, maybe ten years, doing exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to do in this lecture, which is that he's trying to take this theorem, which is organized in some conceptual way, way around uh, uh, spaces of leaves thought of as uh, groupoids or stacks and he's trying to banish everything but estimates for the Dirac operator and the amazing thing is he succeeded in the course of 60 pages in doing this uh, in, in, in completely banishing all of the geometry and making the whole thing one gigantic analytic calculation and for him that's progress and I salute that <laughs> you know I got, you have to salute that because uh, you know, looking back at uh, this quantization commutes with reduction theorem, he proved the theorem in a beautiful way using hard analysis, and uh, you've got to respect to what he did. So there are different ways of thinking about mathematics, and the stuff that you'll find in the papers of Wei-Ping Zhang should be approached, uh, should be greeted with respect, even though it's analysis, uh, not uh, with uh, fear or derision. All right. Sorry, end of digression. That was probably a very bad... When you told me I had 60 minutes, you know, I just kind of went crazy and thought I'd tell you all sorts of stuff. But now you know this amazing theorem. Although Alain has a very beautiful conceptual proof of this, the details, the details are still... Uh, under, under the hood, so to speak, the, the hidden details are still quite complicated and it would be a, a very great problem for this crowd to do something between what Wei-Ping Zhang did and what Alain Khan did, which is to, find a, uh, to increase the amount of geometry but in a slightly more uh, um, conceptual, I don't know, to, 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 do, to do this using more geometry and less analysis still than what Alain did. So there you go, there's a, there's a homework problem for you. All right, now um, back to business. Oh, yeah. So our, our, our aim is to try and say something intelligent about this theorem or this problem in, in, in more generality, but in fact we'll focus uh, on this theorem. And in order to do that, we need some techniques. Uh, we have some k-homology, but we need to uh, use uh, some tools. I just gave you definitions so far. Here's one thing you can do in k-homology, which uh, by itself helps tremendously conceptualize what these guys in uh, Dirac uh, operator theory do. Suppose I have a space X, and inside of that space I have a subspace Y. I'm going to draw a picture, and the picture is not going to be a picture from the world of k-homology. It will be a picture just from the ordinary world of bordism. Bordism is an example of another homology theory. Here's a relative cycle. In fact, 
to this picture, depending on what the manifold is, what kind of manifold the manifold is. This is a relative homology cycle for almost anyone's definition of uh, flavor, favorite flavor of homology. There's a relative cycle. Suppose you have a relative cycle like this. And suppose you're given a reason, an explicit demonstration of the fact that the boundary of this cycle is zero in the homology of uh, the boundary space Y. Maybe to begin with it was an N cycle, and now it's an N minus 1 cycle, like that. Like this. Mm. There's a reason why the boundary is a zero cycle in the homology of Y. I made it the boundary of something which lives in Y. And that reason determines a class, an absolute class in the homology of X, not a relative class. So here we're, we're talking about relative, relative homology, like you can do in homology theories. Okay, but if you have a reason, not just a guarantee that the class is zero, if you know that the class is zero, then by the long exact homology theory, uh, theorem, you know, or uh, axiom, I guess, the long exact sequence axiom in homology, you know there will be some class here uh, which maps to this relative class. But if you have a reason, a particular reason why the boundary is zero, then you get an actual pullback. Okay, you just glue these two pieces together in the case of uh, homology, in the case of Buddhism, don't you? And here's, um, you can all see this, I guess, no need to lift it up. So this isn't a theorem, it's not a theorem about abstract homology theories because it doesn't make sense until you have a concrete way of defining the homology theory. But as a matter of practice, each time you have a homology theory defined in some concrete way, there is such a, uh, a process. Okay, You have to say exactly what it is, and I'm not going to do that, uh, except in this Buddhism picture where it's obvious. But uh, among other things, you can do this analytically in analytic k-homology. If you have an analytic cycle whose boundary is zero, and if you have a reason why that cycle is zero, then that reason determines a, a complete cycle backwards in the homology, of the, t the absolute homology. It's interesting to do this from the point of view of analysis, because in, 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 in the world of k-homology, for example, if you're dealing with the k-homology of a point, uh, a reason, a sufficient reason for a homology class to be zero would be that the operator be invertible. If you have an operator, a operator, which is actually an invertible operator in the k-homology of a point, then that gives a reason for the k-homology class to be zero. So whenever you're in a situation where you have some Dirac operator on a manifold and the boundary Dirac operator is invertible, okay, then you get some absolute index problem which has a definite index and, uh, and that's what the atiopitoti singer index is all about. So this fits into analysis in a rather interesting way. It's a, it's a kind of a vacuous point, but nevertheless it's very interesting and helpful to conceptualize difficult problems like atiopitoti singer theory in this uh, homological way. Here's a an elaboration of that, you might call this excision. Here's a couple of spaces, x1 and x2, and y is the intersection. And the whole space is maybe x. Suppose I have a cycle in the whole space. I suppose there's a reason. So if I have a cycle in the whole space, I can think of it as a relative cycle and, uh, for x relative to x2, and then by excision I can think of it as a relative cycle for x relative to y. And suppose I have a reason that the boundary in y is equal to zero. That means suppose I have a reason that this guy here uh, in the world of Buddhism is a boundary like that. If I have such a reason, then I can break up my space, can't I? You can see what's coming into two bits. Just tack on a circle there, and I can tack on a disk rather, and I can do the same thing here. And this obviously maps down to the same space. And these two things are the same. This is an identity which is taking place in the k homology of X.
or the whatever homology you were dealing with. So this Atiyopatodi Singer construction, this absolutization construction, it gives you a way of chopping up cycles into little bits. Okay? In the world of index theory, uh, for example, as we'll see in just a moment, God willing, in the world of index theory, it's uh, a frequent technique to localize the index of an operator near some critical set and then do a calculation near some critical set. I'll remind you of the basic example in a moment. What that means in homology is this trick. If you have a cycle, which is basically an elliptic operator, and you want to break it up into bits, uh, localize it over here and over here, break it up into two localized bits, then the way to do it is to calculate some boundary piece using the excision axiom in homology and give a reason why that boundary piece is zero, as indicated in this picture. So this is a very important technique and it removes many of the epsilons from the sort of asymptotic analysis you need in when you concentrate an index of an operator near some critical set. Okay, so that's one technique. We can break up indices uh, into bits. And here we go. Do you get the idea? I mean, I'm not going to, I don't propose to say any more uh, about that in detail. Here's the other technique which is related to this business of asymptotic analysis. And now I'll speak particularly uh, about analytic k-homology in which cycles correspond to elliptic operators. What's really relevant for the construction of analytic k-homology, or the particular construction which is most useful in these types of problems, is to understand, just as you do in the heat uh, equation proof of the index theorem, not a single operator, but some family of operators like this. I'm thinking here of t as marching off to infinity. In place of a single operator, maybe I'll give this a name. So what really defines an analytic k-homology cycle is not a single operator in general. You can be more flexible than that. Like I said, there are lots and lots of analytic k-homology cycles. What's really important, because I lied a little bit before, is not a single operator, but a family of operators like this, a family of Fredholm operators. Okay. And the family doesn't have to be just given by a single uh, operator. Any uh, of a wide variety of uh, op families would do. For example, here's something that you see all the time in this uh, subject. Start off with a Dirac operator on a manifold. Okay, you multiply by 1 over t, like this. You have some asymptotic family of operators. And then you add some potential terms, some endomorphism, some bounded function, matrix valued function. And instead of letting t go to 0, it doesn't really matter what you do with t. You could let it go to infinity instead of go to 0, like that. Okay, and this family would give an analytic k-homology class. So what's actually going on here? is that you assemble k-homology, you can assemble k-homology uh, from what are called asymptotic morphisms. I said that the algebra of functions on a space uh, is very relevant to the construction of analytic k-homology cycles. Suppose I also have a function on the real line. Suppose I have a function on the real line, and suppose it's a continuous function which vanishes at infinity. So uh, 1 over 1 plus x squared would do the job. Uh, f of x equals x wouldn't. It would have to vanish at infinity. Okay? Here's a construction you can do. And you'll end up in the C star algebra of compact operators. For example, if we're looking at... Uh, direct type operators, you could do the following thing. You could take a function f here and a function h here and you could do, it's a little bit strange, you could do for this function what you could do is you could apply it in the sense of the spectral theorem to this family of operators. 
That's one way of building an operator over here. On the other hand, a simpler way is just to take the function uh, h and, and use it to build a multiplication operator. And the fact about these two operators that I wrote down, one using the functional calculus and the other using the multiplication action, is that they almost commute with one another. They asymptotically commute. That's expressing one of the key ideas in uh, you know, localization theory. So this map, it's, it's a family of maps, isn't it? It's one, one, map, for, one map for each t. Not, uh, for each individual t, it's not an algebra homomorphism, because if it was an algebra homomorphism, the image of this abelian algebra would have to be abelian, which it isn't, because this operator here doesn't commute with this operator to here. But it does commute asymptotically. That's an easy calculation. Okay. So that's a little glimpse into what's uh, inside the world of analytic k-homology. Okay. It's relevant. In fact, it's part of the definition to study not individual operators, but families of operators. All right. And now let me come in the final dying minutes to the punchlines. Here's a little toy model, and then we'll consider the fancier model. Here's a little toy model which, is, uh, which you could handle in many, many simpler ways, but it kind of illustrates the point here. Suppose M is now a closed uh, manifold, some Riemannian manifold. I suppose F is a Morse function. What uh, Witten taught us, we're only going to use the very most facile parts of what Witten taught us here, is that it's very interesting to study this perturbation of the Durham operator, which is a conjugation by some function like this. So what does this uh, amount to? It seems to me that this amounts to D plus the operator of wedging with DF, uh, like that. It's kind of interesting to uh, study this perturbed uh, Durham differential. Oops, let me go over here, sorry. And then study, as you do in index theory, the associated uh, Durham operator. And then study, as you do in uh, Hodge theory, the harmonic forms for this Durham operator, this is what Witten did, and you can calculate what this is, it's not very hard. There's a term which is just the Laplacian, there's a term which is just the norm squared of some vector field, which is not very mysterious, this is just the gradient vector field of F. And then there's a term in the middle, which turns out to be the lead derivative of X, plus the, it has to be self-adjoint, so the adjoint of the lead derivative like that. That's an easy uh, calculation. Now, if you, if you look at uh, a lead derivative operator as a, as a Hilbert space operator, it's not necessarily self-adjoint. In fact, it's almost a uh, skewer joint. If you add it to its adjoint, you practically get zero. You would get zero if it's a killing vector field. Uh, in general, what you get is some divergence term for the vector field like that. So there's a calculation which is very easy. One of the things that uh, uh, Wei Ping Zhang really hates is the differential calculus, you know, Cartan homotopy formula and so on. If it's not a calculation using the spin connection, he's just not interested in it. But these formulas look nicer if you do them in this way. Anyway, now let's replace uh, F by TF. When you replace F by TF, of course, the gradient field gets replaced by T times the gradient field. So this is a term. This is just some scalar function, which is T squared. T is supposed to be a big number times this mod X squared. This function is going to be really, really big everywhere except where the, where the vector field vanishes at the critical points of F. Okay? So this operator is going to be invertible by virtue of this huge term here everywhere except near the critical points of F. And by virtue of that, we can apply this localization t technique and, and reach the following conclusion. So we're using the analytic version of this statement here in this more refined excision version over there. I didn't draw a picture of my manifold. Let me do it now. So here's my manifold and 
Here are the critical points, not very realistically, the critical points of this Morse function. And let me just draw a little closed disk around these guys. So D is just the union of these closed disks. Let me see. And the conclusion is that the class in K homology localizes to D. That is to say, it's in the image of the map from the K homology of D to the K homology of the manifold M. This, of course, is just the K homology of the three fixed points, P1, by homotopy invariance. So it's really, really easy. This uh, Durham operator is actually supported on, on a finite set. From the point of view of homology, it's completely trivial. It's pushed forward from a finite discrete set into the manifold. So this example tri shows you that the, the class of the Durham operator is trivial in k-homology. This is easy to see by other means as well. But now let's do the following experiment. Apropos of quantization commutes with reduction, this is what uh, Tian and Zhang did. Ooh. Last board. So let me put it this way. Suppose now M is for simplicity, not just a symplectic manifold, but a Kähler manifold. The Durham differential that I was discussing before now breaks up into a holomorphic bit, which I'll call D prime, and an anti-holomorphic bit, the D bar operator, which I'll call D double prime. It just makes the calculations a little bit easier. And now you can repeat, uh, you can attempt to repeat this story here for a much more interesting operator. It's known that uh, although the Durham operator is supported on a finite set, it's completely uninteresting from the point of view of K homology. Exactly the opposite is true of uh, the Dolbo operator. So it's kind of interesting to see what's going to happen. Well, the first part of the story is pretty easy. If you square the operator, and just repeat, it's not so hard to see what happens. There's a factor of two, which I will just ignore. Maybe I'll put it here once. There's a middle term, and then there's the size of the vector field x, like before. x is the gradient, the ordinary gradient of the vector field x. And what is this uh, L double prime? It's this type of thing uh, here. And now something kind of interesting happens when you attempt to repeat the analysis, because back here in the world of uh, real analysis and Riemannian geometry, if you have a Lie derivative operator, it's practically a skewer joint operator. If you have a Lie derivative operator, it's practically skewer joint. So the cross term, the stuff in the middle, is some small bounded term, which is the reason the analysis works out so well. Okay, but that's not going to work out here. This is not an order zero operator. By virtue of this. In fact, when you add L double prime to its adjoint, these terms aren't going to cancel, are they? They're going to add. <laughs> right? You're practically going to get two times I times the Lie derivative uh, of Jx. But now suppose a group was acting, suppose a group was acting, and suppose we only looked at the action of the Dirac operator or this Dolbo operator on invariant uh, forms, forms which are fixed under the action of the group. And suppose you had a vector field x with the property that j times x uh, was actually a killing vector field, okay, pointed in the direction of the action. Okay, then you could forget about this term, it would just go away. You could forget about the term and you could repeat uh, what happens exactly as you did before. And that's exactly uh, what we need to do because in this quantization commutes with reduction problem, it's all about taking the class of the Dolbo operator and restricting it to the G invariant functions and when, uh, forms. And when you restrict to the G invariant forms, this term goes away. 
and is business as usual and therefore the operator restricts to the critical set of x here. Okay, x was the gradient of f, what f should you choose? You should choose uh, the norm squared of the moment map. That breaks up the class of the Dirac operator, the Dolbo operator, into bits. And there's a bit, what are the critical points of norm squared of the moment map? There are mu inverse of zero, where we want to localize the operator. And then there are a few other bits. You know, there, there could be critical values of, uh, of this uh, norm squared of the moment map, critical as vanishing points of the Cohen vector field, which, which, which uh, do not correspond to points in the reduced uh, space. Those you have to analyze uh, more carefully, but the way you analyze them is by this same asymptotic method that you did before. And I didn't mention it, but one of the great values of this asymptotic method is that as t goes to infinity, as t goes to infinity, you can forget about the manifold, really, because as t goes to infinity, t inverse d only sees the manifold as a vector space. So the final calculation on vanishing of contributions from uh, interesting critical points of the uh, moment map. The final calculation is actually done on a flat Euclidean space. Okay, I said for simplicity M is Kähler, but every flat Euclidean or Hermitian space vector space is Kähler. So the calculation you need to do to show that there are, there's only one contribution to this localized uh, Dolbo operator, which is the contribution from mu inverse of zero, that final calculation, cal calculation can be done on a, on a vector space. Okay, then you roll up your sleeves and you do it. All right, thanks very much. Sorry for going over.